Good morning. Um, we're going to do things a little bit different this morning in terms of the um, cataloging committee meeting, and I hope you all um, like it better. I feel like lately it's been kind of Dia just sharing information, and, and that I don't think is the best thing for all of us. So um, we're kind of spreading out some of the topics um, to some of the other mentors. So um, I'm going to start it off with Beth, and I'm going to bring up the um, SAGE website for you. Can you all see that? Okay, um, specifically, I was wanting to address some changes, uh, recent changes that I made to the cataloging um, page. So if you could click on the cataloging link. So um, what I've done is try to um, reorganize things on the page and um, give some more instant access to resources and instructions um, that maybe we want access to more frequently. Um, so that's what I've done with this page. And the, there's a new resources block that gives um, the link to the standards manual, as well as the um, cheat sheet that we recently sent out. Um, I added the GMD list, the 999 list, um, We've gotten some questions on the 33X um, descriptions, so that's on there. And then if you click on more resources, it takes you to um, the actual resources page um, that gives you even more um, resources available to you. Um, and the instruction block um, on the previous pages is, is about the same. Um, what I did was I added links to the most recent cataloging sessions that we have um, up on YouTube. And um, so we'll continue to refine these blocks, but I think it gives us a little bit more um, visibility to, to certain things that um, we feel the catalogers are going to be using on a regular basis. So anyway, um, welcome any um, critique or things that you guys want to see added to this page or um, things that aren't working, please give me feedback. Any questions? Sorry, I'm a little bit late. There was a ton of ILLs this morning. Anna, I see your chat message um, that your email address is wrong. I will make that change. Okay, and I saw your chat message as well as, as the phone number. Um, I will add that. All right, thanks everybody. If, if you think of something um, later, just send me an email. Do you want me to go to the next thing on the agenda, Dia? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, the next topic on the agenda was the staff, um, the cataloging sessions that we're doing. And um, just wanted to kind of briefly 
talk about those. I think they've been going well. Um, participation has been great. We're going to be doing another one um, this Thursday on parts management, um, why we have parts management and how to do it. I know Dee is going to touch briefly today um, on a specific case, but anyway, that's our upcoming session. I will be sending out a link after the committee meeting so that folks can join us. Thanks, Beth. So on, on um, parts management, I just wanted to kind of put out a reminder more than anything that um, when, when you add a part um, to a record, please be sure to look to see if there's already a part existing for what you're going to add. But let's, consider, let's con use consistent language. So like when we're doing um, a set of videos, um, the agreed upon terminology was complete set. So um, let's try to use that term um, as opposed to some other. Uh, mainly it's so that we're not confusing each other as catalogers, but especially we're not confusing our patrons. Because if they're seeing varying forms of different things, they're not quite sure what they're seeing. And we've seen that come up recently. So just kind of wanted to give a reminder to that. But also I wanted to remind, remind you that um, there are also within the system some um, resources that we've decided are continuing resources in nature, such as um, the Oregon Blue Book or the Oregon Driver's Manual. And um, so what we're doing is we're adding many different additions to one record as opposed to having you know, a dozen different records for different editions. So that would be another place where parts management would be a great use because then a patron can place a hold on something for a specific edition that they'd like. Any questions that that raises? Yeah, this is John in uh, Baker City. I did have a question about that. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and the question is in relation to open-ended versus contained uh, records. So as you mentioned, the Blue Book record versus, say, a, a season of a uh, television show, for example. Um, it was my understanding that parts were used for those contained type records where there won't be more additions to it, uh, as opposed to the um, ones where we have that are annuals, for example, where there are additions added every single year. Um, am I incorrect in that? I thought that was discussed somewhere earlier. If it was discussed earlier, I don't recall that. Um, but we've been using that method since we started using the parts management. Um, because not everyone has the most recent edition, say, of uh, Blue Book. Well, most of the Blue Books, that's generally not the case. But of several different things, some people don't have the most recent edition out yet. And so if someone's if a patron or a staff person was to place a hold on a on a particular item or wanted a specific edition the only way they could do that would be that way if i'm understanding right. your question correctly yeah so i mean the difference being that in one of those open ended records that there is no um there is no current finite end to it such as the the blue book Correct. Um, my understanding was that instead of using parts management, we were using um, other information such as call number for that type of information, whereas parts management was used for something that had a finite end. Uh, does that make more this sense? Is, this is Lori, and I recall that conversation with David, and that is what we decided 
um, we don't add parts to an ongoing publication. We just add that information in the call number, and that's what I've done for years. Uh, is that is that what you're saying, John? That's exactly what I'm saying. It might be helpful. Hi, this is Anna. Sorry to interrupt here. It might be helpful to bring up the um, the organ driver's manual example because I don't know if <coughs> the confusion here is also that. So the organ driver's manual is also classified as a magazine, right? To then have the um, kind of those multiple entries, but then. Right then, there's kind of the parts management that's added on to that to help further distinguish that. Oh, this is the you know 2018 uh, version as opposed to the 2016. Um, but it, I think, seeing that record might help clarify some of that. And I don't know. I am bringing it up as we speak. Okay, if that discussion took place, I never heard it, and um, I don't recall that, but we have always suggested that the call number have that added information in it. So that's great, because then you can identify it, but with, with us having the ability for patrons to place holds on things, if they placed a hold, say, on the Oregon Driver Manual, it would be whatever copy comes available first in the in the way the holes is set up. So is there a specific thing you were thinking about looking at here, Anna, or? Oh, just I, I just thought it would be helpful to for everyone to be able to see how the, the those two aspects um, work in with this record and as you just said right that if if somebody puts um just a generic hold on the item they're not guaranteed to get a specific volume in this way with the parts management they can mm -hmm. but at the same time it is sort of that ongoing record because it is um uh using that magazine format this is Lori, and there's no problem adding, I guess, the part in addition, but it, it, I think it's more important in this case to make sure that information is in the call, uh, the call numbering or call, you know, the call name. Because I can see now some people haven't added the year to their items, and patrons won't readily see that information, I think. No, I agree. So there's no problem needs... adding the parts. I, Right, there's no problem doing it. But David Sale had trained us here in our regional meeting, and that was a difference that somebody from Lakeview brought up. And we agreed that it was important to put it in the call number on those types of things, but we Absolutely. didn't necessarily have to add parts. Absolutely, it's it's all but critical there, um, because otherwise you have no way of knowing what um, what year a library holds or or what what sections but because of the parts management right if somebody puts a hold on um, on the organ driver manual then when they go to place a hold they will specifically be asked which part they are requesting and that's where Correct. it becomes important Correct. that there is that consistency that everyone has added the part element onto that otherwise um, it um, I don't know what happens with, for instance, you know, those items where there isn't anything listed. They would be so, in a in a group separate from. So if I, can I just jump in here since mm -hmm. you have this on the, the screen and these are all our our items. I'm mm -hmm. glad I asked this question because I am currently going through these uh, driver manuals that we have. And as you can see on the screen there, all of the previous manuals that we have all at uh, all of our uh, county branches there, the 2016, 2017, I noticed did have parts management assigned to them, even though the information is already in the call number, as you can see. 
Uh, now for the most recent one, you can see there that we've got placed in our reference section. Uh, it is in the call number, you can see the 2018-2019 uh, that does, has not been assigned a part um, based on what we've been talking about, that open-ended records. Um, I'm not exactly sure reason, the reason why, but my guess would be since there are so many items uh, the possibility for inconsistency, as you all have been pointing out, is much, much greater. Because um, uh, if you have, you know, um, 100 items or 200 items on a record and they're using parts management, um, the, the chances for inconsistency, I think, are much greater there than if you were just using finite closed records such as a TV season. Does does that make sense to anybody? That's that's the explanation for what you're seeing on the screen right now. And so obviously that needs to change to be consistent and that's why I wanted to ask the question. No, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that, John. Uh, and it may be that um, these older ones were ones that got cleaned up at some point um, when possibly it was identified that there were some multiple um, records out there <clears throat> that got merged <clears throat> and got cleaned up, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to add that part because it was identifiable through the call number. And I think one of the reasons we decided to assign parts to the Oregon driver manual is the um, looking at the likelihood that someone is going to want to place a hold on a specific edition versus any edition. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to me. Um, I, I view the likelihood of somebody wanting to view the driver manual from 10 years ago as not very likely. Right. Um, Heather, I see in the chat that you asked specifically if there's a list of those that we're wanting to do this with. Um, I don't know that we've ever put together uh, a list in completion. Um, the driver's manuals, the blue book, are two really good examples that every year get added to. Um, a number of the travel magazines, or the, excuse me, the travel um, books, if they come out, in recurring editions and are updated. We've tried to do that with as well. Um, beyond that, at the moment, my brain just kind of went, I can't remember. <laughs> Oregon Foundation book would possibly be a good one, and that's probably, that may be a record that's done as a serial. And if it is, then that would be one that also would be Ford or Travel Guides, yes. So I'm going to look up um, the Oregon Foundation data book and see if that is indeed one that's being done that way. These are part of a group that's called monographic serials. Mm -hmm. they're, they're books that have a you know repetition as opposed to like a regular journal or a magazine. So it looks like the Oregon Foundation data book should be, but it looks like the vast majority have not been um, notated as such. So that could be something that could be a cleanup project. But obviously when they're referenced, oftentimes they're not holdable, so that doesn't really impact them particularly either at that point, but. But it's probably easier if we do consistently so that if we move them out of, it's already taken care of. Yeah, good point. So maybe part of the easier way rather than creating a specific list of these types of items is, is thinking in terms of it the way Beth just described it. These are um, more of an open, 
um, record um, in terms of a start date and an end date. There isn't always necessarily an end date. They're more of a, a serial type of a record. And so because of that, it lends itself to having much more um, capacity for having a number of different editions, a number of different years, etc. And where, this is Anne again, sorry, and where the author tends to stay fairly consistent because in most of these cases, these are like um, government institutions or foundations, things like that. The travel guides are a little bit different because they can vary quite a bit from year to year, sometimes not be produced every year. So we tend not to do travel guides as um, these kind of ongoing uh, serial. Some of the travel guides we have chosen to do um, like folders, they tend to put it out every year, and it's pretty much the same group. They just update. Um. We and might want to consider. Sorry, Beth. Uh, yeah. We we might want to consider not right now, but uh, in the future. Uh, Dia, just like you clarified, um, using complete set verbiage, um, we may want to consider. Um, uh, coming up with preferred uh, verbiage for for part records because I can see um, that becoming an issue too. Uh, we actually did um, come up with some terminology and I'm going to dig up that document and put it up on the website. Um, it's at least a starting point. We may still have some things that that aren't ironed out in that document um, but we, we came up with some consistent terminology um, for a lot of situations anyway. And we did that when we first started working yeah. with ports management because this is a fairly new um, piece to the Evergreen software. I'd say maybe two years. I'd forgotten we had put that together, Beth, so thank you for remembering that. Yeah, I made a note out of I thought, well, we're doing this session this Thursday and I'm making changes to the website, so it's a good time to, to pull all that stuff together. Um, and, and one of the things um, that I wanted to mention on these records was at one point in the system, a while back, we would have individual bibliographic records for different years, um, but it became an issue in the catalog as far as being more difficult for the patron to find the guide. Um, you know, they had to dig through a lot of records to find maybe the most recent one. So um, at one point we decided let's treat this as a monographic serial and group multiple editions under it and um, it, it made it more retrievable by the patron. This is Lori and my advice related to uh, Heather's question is on your initial search, don't rely on ISBN, but do your keyword title search. And if you find a monographic bib for an ongoing publication, um, I think you can judge from that that that's probably the best way for you to add your items. You certainly should check to see if there is an ongoing publication bib before you make a new bib for an individual item. Any further questions or items for discussion on this topic? Okay, well then, um, Lori, do you wanna talk about um, where we're at with the uh, CAT1, a CAT1 update. Yes, and I'll keep it brief because I don't have a very good voice. Um, yeah, the situation we're in, the mentors and the staff, is just that we've been really trying hard to provide um, more trainings and more outreach and to improve access to the cataloging 
uh, resources, as Beth talked about early this morning, adding more uh, reference materials on the SAGE web, that we just don't find that any of us have any time to do extra training individually for CAT1 advancement at this time. But we are working really hard to provide more overall trainings. Uh, and I think everyone can benefit from that. We all agree that through monitoring of the bibs, we've been doing that for almost a year now. We monitor the monthly new bib reports. And then we discuss what issues are we seeing and what do we need to do to eliminate some of the weaknesses. And we really worked hard to identify these things and to try to improve um, basic training uh, and information for catalogers. Um, and so the monitoring and improving of resources has really required a lot of our extra time and focus. And we all contribute this to SAGE on top of our regular duties within our own libraries. Um, no mentors feel that they have any additional time at this time to take on monitoring a CAT1 interns. Uh, but we have kept the applications, and we will re-evaluate it once we get through this um, four to six months of increased trainings. And then we will try to review and find more time to do some mentoring. Would anybody care to add to that from the mentors group or from staff, please? I think our sincere hope is just to do whatever we can to make everyone um, more confident and independent. And, and then to move ahead with further certification once we feel we've brought the training level up to a true CAT 2. Thanks, Laurie. Anna, you want to question? Oh, go ahead. Are there any questions from the cataloging group at large? Um, so, Lori, am I understanding you correctly that um, because of the, the time constraints that we aren't planning on adding any anybody to cat one status from cat two that is um, training and has passed the requirements is is that what I'm understanding um, I think there are two that two right now that are advancing and and then once those two have advanced then we'll reevaluate the applications we just felt that the general skill set wasn't even at a full cat two level Many of the applicants, um, not all, but many of them, just really needed some additional training to even realize a CAT2 status. And at this time, we just don't have any time, and that's true. But any CAT1 cataloger uh, certainly could volunteer to train if they wanted to. I think right now the requirement is a mentor. So John, if you had time to train, um, you would maybe consider becoming a mentor. We can certainly um, talk about that. Um, let's send some emails back and forth about it, and then uh, we won't take the time right now during the meeting. But uh, yeah, I'd be open to that. Great. There are some comments in the chat, and they're both good. Um, no, I think you have to go through the mentors, Catherine. Uh, it has to go through the mentors because we have to evaluate the progress.
and maybe I maybe um, Catherine's speaking specifically about who the assigned mentor is for her. I'm not sure, but just for clarification, um, we're not specifically limiting this mentorship for Cat One by whoever the assigned groups are. Um, we're looking overall at any mentor that's available to work with this and no one, I mean, we're all stretched right now. And um, that's kind of the big problem at the moment. Um, but like Lori said, we're trying to make sure that we have enough training um, to make sure that everyone feels um, really comfortable in where they're at and that, they're, that they've got the skills they need and the resources they need to be able to do the job. So I hope I, I addressed part of what you asked, Catherine. I'm not sure if that was part of the question. This is Beth. Our, our hope is that by building on the skill level of the cat two catalogers, of which we have the most um, in that category, that um, that's going to increase our time that's going to be available for cat one training, um, since we won't have to be doing as much cleanup and uh, oversight of the, the current cat two cataloging. So it will improve over time. We're just not quite there yet. Well put, Beth. That's exactly what I meant to say. That's, that's exactly where we're at. I mean, as an example here, you know, in, in my staff time, I'm only a half-time employee, and so 20 hours a week. And I would say that just doing, you know, sage cleanup and monitoring and trying to reach out to catalogers, I easily spend over four hours a week on sage, sage outreach, and I, I just can't do any more than that. But, but I think we're getting to a point where it's improving. I do agree that, you know, if catalogers are attending the trainings and they respond to mentors when they reach out to them with consistent cataloging problems and, and improve that, I think our time will free up within a few months. That would be my hope. And Lisa has a text in there also. She'd like to be part of the cleanup projects. Well, no, actually, I don't think that can be done by a CAT2. And so, you know, just work through the CAT2 skills and, and uh, we'll approach, a, you know, you have to be CAT1 to do cleanup. Okay, are there any other additional questions or comments? Hearing nothing, Anna, would you like to give a little update on what we're doing with read-alongs? Okay, great. Um, yeah, hi everyone, this is Anna. So um, we just wanted to let everyone know that we are currently working on standardizing the record format for read-alongs. Um, for those of you who are not familiar or less familiar with read-alongs, these are um, 
generally kids books, mostly picture books, sometimes readers as well, that have a CD included. Um, it used to be like an audio cassette, obviously. <laughs> uh, we don't see many of those anymore. Um, but, um, and then specifically the CD um, is uh, is generally an audio version of the book itself um, so that kids can listen to the text and then read along as well, which is why we often hear the term read along. Um, sometimes you'll find a little bit additional information on those CDs. Um, there might be a little bit of music, but generally uh, there is that audio version. Um, so many of you uh, who or at least those of you who are more familiar with the, the read-alongs, you may have noticed that there's actually quite a bit of variation in the record formats in SAGE for those items. Um, sometimes you'll see them as books or audiobooks. Um, we had been um, asking people to uh, enter them as kits, and we're uh, reevaluating whether they actually fit as kits. Um, so that's why we're trying to, to standardize this format a bit more. Um, so we're currently experimenting with different formats, um, and we wanted to make sure that everyone knew while we're working on this that you may see some records in the catalog that look a little different. So for the moment, uh, you don't have to worry about any of this. Uh, we just wanted to give you a heads up on that. We will provide uh, fuller instructions once we've worked, um, worked everything out. We're also currently trying to do some troubleshooting so that we can work out any of these kinks before we actually present the, um, the information to you. And along those lines, if any of you are planning to import new records for read-alongs in the next month or so, um, we thought we might um, ask if you could actually contact the mentors and let us know about these records. Since we are troubleshooting, it's helpful for us to have some of these newer examples to play around with. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, I don't know if any of the mentors have anything else to add to that. I wondered, Anna, this is Beth, if it would be helpful um, to see one of the ones that we've cataloged, um, this new way in the catalog. Oh, right. Um, so I think, was it the, oh, I don't have those. Oops, I don't have those records on me. I'm at home right now. Um, there was the Star Wars one. Uh, what was that? Anna, did you do any of the I, ones I, that yeah. you sent examples to the mentors? Yeah. Because okay, I, yeah, I just I, found that. Okay. I have the IDs, the database IDs. Okay. Try 1940784. Great. So I'll go down to the, the mark record so that we can show. So Anna, go ahead and you can speak to and I'll move the thing as you need. Um, so some of you, uh, you'll notice here in the, uh, where's the 245? Um, we've added a GMD of book with CD. Um, we have, uh, you'll see in the 300, and 
again, we're working on this because there are different formats. Sometimes you'll see it listed as an audio disc with an additional book. Sometimes it's listed as a book with an additional audio disc. Um, uh, but then you'll have um, 336s, 337s, and 338s that um, include all of that information. So one set for an audio disc, one set for a book as well. Um, there is, uh, oh, in the, I think there was a six, was it a 690 that we added? Um, yeah, so a 690 read along and, um, and then in the um, 999, both book and audio book CD. There's some other um, things that are, in these records. Um, again, we'll go over some of this more fully um, later on, but if we go back to the OPAC view, um, you'll see that it actually displays with both a book and an audio um, or book on CD, um, both of those icons as well. So that's kind of the new format that we're playing with right now. Again, we're trying to um, work through some of the issues to make sure that this is uh, something that is easy for everyone to um there will in order when you import a record none of the records are going to look quite like this so there's a little tweaking that has to happen in order to have a bit of a more standardized format um and so we're playing around and trying to see if we can um make that uh, simplify that as much as possible um to have this standardized standardization And this is Lori, and I think our goal is to have the procedure out by the next cataloging committee meeting, um, as I understand it. So we'll work through the wrinkles and get it out to everyone. And yes, Lisa had a comment. Um, it's just so easy, easy to grab info for the um, for the patron. And yes, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is make it a little clearer which of these items are actually read-alongs as opposed to um, uh, a, you know, strictly an audio book or, um, or just a book itself. Any questions? Well, thanks everyone. Again, we'll keep you updated on that. And please, yes, if you're um, if you're planning on cataloging any of these items, please uh, shoot an email over to the mentors to let us know. Thanks, Anna. And the the only um, other piece. Oh, sorry. It looks like there yeah, is I was a just question that, that came in <laughs> all late. So if the book is in the system, um, we make a duplicate and then make it a read along. So right now, um, you don't need to do anything with these. Um, again, we're we're working on. Um, on how to to you know um, create a more standardized format, we'll probably I don't know Beth, you might be able to speak to this. We'll probably do some cleanup on older records once we figure this stuff out, and then it'll be mostly a question of um, of catalogers working on um, uh, reproducing this format for new records that they're importing. Um, that's that's right, Anna. I think I'm wondering if Jenny. Um, what you're getting at is um, there, there's there's some libraries that have just the book and other libraries that have the book with CD um, and if there does need to be two separate records if it's just the book does that make sense 
Oh yeah, sorry, I misread the question there. I see what Jenny said. Well, it could be interpreted two ways, so that's why I was um, trying to make sure because I, that's part of the confusion, um, because the, oftentimes the same book is is you know published obviously without the CD, um, and so we would have two different records in the system if um, if it's just a standalone and not with the CD. Good clarification question. And that was one of the reasons why we started <laughs> looking at this GMD, because we wanted to make sure that everybody knew that this was the edition that has a CD. Um, this is not just the book. And we wanted to make it real clear to the patrons um, you know, as we were reevaluating all of this and debating about how to deal with, um, it's not so much, um, we kind of stretched the, the, the kit concept a little bit years ago when um, we decided to use, but they were two very separate parts that couldn't be housed together very easily. And so that was part of the um, original idea when we decided to make them kits and that isn't so much the case anymore these can actually be shelved right on the shelf not have to be separate and so we wanted to just make as clear um, as possible to the patrons and of course to staff as well so that's why we're toying with this new gmd so if you actually see an item in the system um, please don't remove this one <laughs> Okay, so the, the last um, topic that we have on the agenda this morning um, has to do with um, the um, new bib re rep reports, um, which actually I think mostly um, Lori mentioned earlier when she did the Cat1 update and really talked uh, about what we've been using those for. Um, we've asked Beth to create, and by we, mentors, I should clarify that, have asked the, um, that Beth uh, create a uh, um, report for us every month of all the new bibs that have been um, imported into the system and or created in the system so that we can just kind of um, have a way to kind of track things if we're seeing something that may be an anomaly. Um, we don't concern ourselves so much, but if we're seeing something that you know, we're seeing on a quite often coming back up. We want to have a way to see is this a, is this an anomaly that we just have run across a couple times, or is it truly something that we need to address in terms of training for any particular um, cataloger or as a group even. You know, if we're seeing something consistent between multiple catalogers, then it's a good idea for us to do something where we do uh, a specific uh, a specific focus on a training. Um, and so things like the, the short trainings that Beth has been doing of late, we can do a focus on something that maybe is coming up that way. It just gives us a better idea as to where we maybe are lacking in our training. And so um, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so that's, that's what that's about. And how this actually started was that um, we were trying to track how we were getting duplicates, so many duplicates in the system for a time frame, and we found that it was valuable to continue this. So um, we've actually been looking at, at this type of a report for mm, probably the better part of a year, like Lori said. We might also ask if um, if anyone has suggestions. Are there are there specific trainings that that people are are looking for? Yeah, we're always open to that. 
um, I, a few months ago, we asked for um, suggestions, and um, we have actually um, been keeping a list, and um, we're kind of been going through that as the mentors and um, trying to evaluate what should come next and and where we need to you know kind of beef up some things in terms of how we're going to approach this or maybe break them down so that we can fit them into these short little sessions. So, but yes, please. Um, Share those with Beth. Share those with any of the mentors. Um, and um, they will be really helpful for us to know where um, things are that you all feel you need some targeted um, focus trainings. But if anybody has suggestions right now, we, we're open to taking those too. The trainings of late Anne have been about every two weeks, um, and we're we're looking at um, if that's really um, the kind of time frame that we need, or if the dates are the best dates. Um, so there's going to be some some um, polling sent out fairly soon, if I remember correctly, Beth, um, to to kind of gauge that. The original date and time was just kind of arbitrarily set. So we've actually gotten some pretty good response so far, though. And we will record them all and make sure that they are posted so that if you can't attend them at the specific time or if something comes up, you know, if you end up having to stay home ill one day, heaven forbid, um, you know, you'll still have access to them, so. Yeah, this is Beth. The, the training will be um, on the same schedule this week, Thursday at 1 o'clock. Um, but after this training, we're going to poll and make sure that this is really the optimum time. Um, so depending on how long... Um, we leave the poll um, out there, it might be that there's three weeks in between, um, but we'll see what we can do to um, be consistent. We just didn't want to overwhelm folks. Dia, this is Lori, and I logged in at about one minute after 11. Mm -hmm. Did you guys go through the minutes before I got on board? No, we didn't. Thank you. Totally forgot that because I didn't have that on my little short list. So. I'll bet none of us read them recently. I didn't. And I didn't think to send them back out again. So I think we have a couple of sets of minutes that we still need to um, no, I think we're caught up. Are we caught up? We did okay. catch up last time. Yeah, we just have the December meeting. Okay. And did they get sent out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm, but they didn't get resent. So if we want to wait to read through them and approve them at the next meeting, that might be a good idea. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. Looks like that's kind of where most folks are kind of leaning. So I will try to remember to make sure that's on the agenda topics for next time. That's what happens when I change my, my system a little bit and or have too much going on. 
easy to do. And I was out sick, so I didn't catch it at all. <clears throat> OK. Well, if there is no further bits and pieces, um, our next um, cataloging committee meeting will be in April. I cannot believe that April is around the corner. For the 9th of April um, is the Oh, excuse me, that's not no. correct. It will be the 2nd of April. I have it wrong on my calendar. The 2nd of April is the first Monday um, of the month, and it will be at 11 a.m. in this venue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Goodbye. Have a great day, everyone.